Our next presenter is Peter Schiff, an American stockbroker, financial commentator, and radio personality. He is the CEO and chief global strategist of Euro Pacific Capital Inc., a broker dealer based in Westport, Connecticut. Please welcome Peter Schiff. Peter, how are you? I am well. How are you doing? Very, very good. I'm looking forward to today's conversation and welcoming you to the summit. I guess let's kind of start off. You know, over the last week, we've seen dip do gold dip down to about 1848, 1850, somewhere around there. Silver's dropped down. What's going on? What, what, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, gold got beaten up pretty bad. I think it was down 70 bucks on the week, 4% move, which is significant for gold. I mean, it normally doesn't have a week where it moves uh, to that degree. And I think the, the catalyst was the, the general misunderstanding that investors have with respect to inflation, interest rates, the Fed. You had a significant backup in long-term bond yields during the week. And this followed uh, the recent uh, decision by the Fed not to raise rates, but they continue to talk about inflation being stickier than they thought and having to fight harder than they thought. And so rates may have to stay higher for longer than they thought. And, and so that weighed on the bond market, which also propped up the dollar. I think the way these algorithms have been programmed, rising bond yields are good for the dollar, so they buy the dollar, and a strong dollar is bad for gold, so everybody sells gold. And I think the traders are missing the, the bigger picture here. It's not that the Fed is going to have to try harder to win the inflation fight. It's that it's already lost. That's what the data proves. The Fed has moved rates from zero to five and a half, and inflation is still significantly above their 2% target. And the main reason for that is that they haven't really stopped consumption or debt. Consumers are borrowing at record levels. The government is borrowing at record levels. All this money is being spent. The savings rate has collapsed. And so the higher interest rates have done nothing to uh, deter consumption or to rebuild savings. Uh, and if you look at all of the industrial production numbers, the uh, manufacturing numbers, all these are showing contraction. So the economy is producing less stuff, yet everybody is spending more money and borrowing more money to spend more money. Our trade deficits are at record highs. Our budget deficits are at record highs. Uh, this, this is a recipe for inflation. I mean, inflationary pressures are building in the economy despite these rate hikes. And, and, and what the gold traders don't get or the dollar traders don't get is that the Fed may be pretending that it's going to put the inflation genie back in the bottle. But as soon as it sees significant deterioration in the economy or a major threat to the financial system, both of which are coming, the Fed's going to back off. In fact, the Fed's going to go right back to massive quantitative easing they may even cut rates. I don't think they can go back down to zero, uh, but they may try to cut them a little bit. Uh, and I think that's going to uh, cause the dollar to fall through the floor and, and gold to just go through the roof. Well, with all this warmongering we see with China, do you think there's any chance of actually bringing manufacturing back to the United States? If that actually progresses with Taiwan and China, they're going to have to do something. Well, I mean, manufacturing is not going to come back to the United States until the, you know, the, you have a change to the structure of the economy, because there's a reason that all the manufacturing left the United States. And so unless we change those dynamics, it ain't coming back. Sure. And so what we need is a more business friendly uh, uh, economic environment. We need fewer regulations and lower taxes. And, you know, those don't seem to be on the horizon. Uh, and so we also need more capital investment to finance it, which means we need higher savings. But we're not getting that. Uh, and whatever savings we have is being borrowed by the government. So we don't have the type of economic environment that is conducive to a renaissance in, in manufacturing. Well, I was going to kind of save this till the end of our interview, but I might as well bring it up right now, is election predictions. Do you think that we're going to get a more favorable business event, um, environment, you know, with the 2024 elections coming up? Well, I think there's a there's a very good chance that, that Donald Trump will be 
elected again to a second term, making him the first uh, president to serve two non-consecutive terms. So it's one of my favorite presidents of all time, Grover Cleveland, who happened to be a Democrat. But you know, the Democratic Party today bears no resemblance to the Democratic Party of Grover Cleveland. Uh, he was more of a libertarian uh, than, than, than a modern-day Democrat, although who knows what a modern-day Democrat is. I mean, they're, they're, they're really just fascist at this point. Sure. Um, but yes, I mean, Donald Trump uh, would be more business friendly. He was more bi- business friendly. But unfortunately, uh, he's a big spender. Uh, and he was a big spender uh, in his first term, and he could be an even bigger spender in his next term. You know, he, he doesn't want to make any cuts to uh, government spending, really. And, uh, you know, he's an agitator for cheap money. You know, he was beating up on Jerome Powell because he thought that rates weren't low enough. He wanted negative rates. So he, he's an inflationist. Uh, he's a populist. Uh, so, you know, that's not really going to do it. Uh, now, maybe he could surprise me and, 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 and be a different type of president in his second term than he was in his first term. I mean, sometimes it's possible that when you have no prospect of reelection, uh, that you may you know, take some more chances and, and, and do the right thing. But, um, you know, I, I don't see any indication uh, that, that, uh, that that's going to happen. So I, I, I just think that we have a major uh, crisis coming, a sovereign debt crisis a uh, currency crisis, a banking crisis, financial crisis. I mean, it's going to be horrific. We've been kicking the can down the road for not only years, but decades. Uh, and, and, and during that time period, the problems have just been built up to an enormous degree. Had we confronted these problems years ago when they were smaller, I mean, granted, they were still huge, but not you know relative to how they are today, the crisis would have been smaller <laughs> and easier to recover from. Uh, But because we succeeded in postponing the inevitable, what we're ultimately now going to be confronted with is far worse. And what are your predictions if we get someone on the left in, if we get Gavin Newsom or we get someone else uh, a little bit scary like that into power? Well, I mean, that that just means that in the aftermath of the crisis, I mean, the crisis is going to come no matter who we elect. It's how the government reacts to it. And yes, you know, that type of individual is likely to react to the crisis in a much, uh, you know, more draconian way, Um, you know, blame the crisis on capitalism because these guys don't like capitalism anyway. So they're waiting for any excuse to try to claim it doesn't work. So they'll blame capitalism on a government created crisis and um, their solution will be to vastly expand the power of government. And whenever you make government bigger, you make individuals smaller. You have to limit our freedom in order to grow government. And we can see a massive growth in government as a result of this crisis, which means a significant contraction in individual liberty and freedom in the United States, uh, which is a very sad uh, uh, situation. And, you know, it, you know, a lot of people, and this is probably relevant to what you guys do, but this would probably motivate a lot of people to just leave, you know, leave the country if they can, you know, because they may not, they may make it very difficult for Americans to escape. Yep. This is the, what I've been saying for years, you know, as the doors and the windows are open, I will help people through them and we will get people out. But when things stop being legal and they close all these doors and windows, there's nothing we can do. And we've seen massive amounts of programs, immigration programs closing around the world. And, you know, there's a fight for the exit right now. And we're seeing hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars flee the shores of Canada and the United States for places that are going to yeah. respect freedom a little bit more. But also, it's not just the other countries maybe not letting us in, but America not letting us out. You know, I mean, one thing that nobody really talked about, but there was there was a form. There is a form that if you want to renounce your citizenship, you need to file this form and you can't file it from within the United States. You have to have already left to fill out the form. Now, years ago, the form was free. You just asked for the form and and you got it. But several years ago, they increased the cost to five thousand dollars which, you know, is not an insignificant amount of money. There could be a lot of people that want to renounce their citizenship that don't have the $5,000, right? So they're, they're kind of stuck. But what I started to think about when I saw that they could just arbitrarily charge you $5,000 to fill out a form, right? 
if they can charge 5,000, they can charge 50,000. They could charge 500,000 for that Correct. form. And, and therefore, they could actually make it almost impossible for people to renounce their citizenship. I mean, they're not saying you can't leave. You just have to keep paying tribute in the form of taxation, because the, that's the main reason that people want to renounce a U.S. citizenship. In fact, that's the only reason to get out from under the IRS, because otherwise, sure, you could keep it. You know, you probably have very few people uh, renouncing their British citizenship or their French citizenship or their New Zealand citizenship or their you know, Brazilian, because those countries don't care. If you don't live there, they don't tax you. They leave you alone. You know, so there, there's no burden. But if you want to move offshore, the IRS is like, well, we don't give a damn. We, you got to pay taxes. You got to file all these forms and keep records. And there's also a lot of financial institutions that they find out you're a U.S. citizen. They don't even want to do business with you because of the, the extra uh, burden that is placed on them for, for doing that by, by U.S. regulations. So, 100%. Uh, yeah, they, they, they can make it very difficult. And, you know, when I, when, I, when I ran for Senate unsuccessfully, of course, back in, um, in 2010, I know you've got Ron Paul uh, as part of the summit. So his son, Rand, who I know quite well, he ran that year, too, and he, he won and he's still a U.S. senator today. But I ran and, and, and didn't even get I didn't win. I lost in the primary. I didn't even make it to the general election. But the immigration was a big issue back then. And building a wall, uh, you know, on the southern border with Mexico was always a question that came up. And I was always opposed to the wall. And my main reason was I said, look, a wall works both ways. I mean, right now, you know, we're worried about keeping Americans uh, uh, keeping the Mexicans out. I'm worried about in the future that wall being used to keep Americans in. So, uh, you know, you got to be careful when you're building walls. You know, there was a wall in, in, in Berlin, uh, you know, and uh, it was more to keep the East Germans in than uh, to keep the West Germans out. I mean, the West Germans didn't care about the wall. They were happy to have people come over. They weren't worried about people leaving. Who Nobody would go to East Germany if, if, if they had a choice. Problem was people didn't have a choice. They sure. were stuck there. No, 100%. With my business, we have the conversation with probably, I'd say, seven out of 10 Americans who come through my desk, um, whose cases come through my desk. And we're having the conversation with them about renunciation. And actually what we saw during all of the time of COVID, all of the embassies around the world postponed any application. So you, as you rightly said, you can't do it inside the United States. You have to go overseas. So we were seeing three year, two and a half, three year, four year wait times for Toronto, London, Paris, uh, Tokyo, things like this. So we were sending people to Serbia and to all kinds of random little places um, overseas or in Eastern Europe and things, getting them on a plane and sending them over there just so that they could get out. And absolutely, you're right. The price of renunciation has gone up and there really is nothing to stop them from putting it at $50,000, $500,000. Yeah. Now, of course, they already have the exit tax too, where you have to um, kind of appraise all of your assets and mark them to market and just pay a capital gains tax on your unrealized gains. Um, which, you know, traps a lot of wealthy people in here. Now, they could avoid that if they go to Puerto Rico. You know, I'm already here. So yeah, I think you can get around that in Puerto Rico because the capital gains rate here is, is zero. Um, so, I, you know, any of my unrealized capital gains, you know, have an effective tax rate of zero. So uh, I think I would have a zero exit tax if I, if I were to leave. I so let's go back a little bucks. bit. I, I can afford that. <laughs> sure, now. sure, sure. Um, let's go back a little bit because you mentioned earlier that the target is 2% inflation. Why is the target not zero? Why do we have to have inflation? Or what is the reason they're saying well, that we have well, to have inflation? Well, we don't. I mean, we shouldn't even be targeting it, but we should allow uh, the free market to lower prices. And the lower, the better. So falling prices are better than rising prices. So if we had a rate of minus one or minus two, that's better than zero. I mean, there's no reason to think that we need prices to stay stable. I mean, stable is better than rising by 2% a year. But they've even redefined stability to mean rising 2% a year. There's nothing stable about a steady increase other than the rate of increase is stable, but the prices themselves are not stable. And, you know, before we had a central bank, when we were on sound money on a gold standard, 
prices went down. If you look at the CPI, and you can get these statistics, and you look at the CPI in 1900, and you compare it to the CPI in 1800, prices were cut in half over 100 years. So that's 100 years of falling prices. Now, they want to call that deflation or rising prices, inflation. You know, inflation is the expansion of the money supply, and, and, and deflation is a contraction of the money supply. Prices are separate. Right? They, prices don't expand and contract. They go up and down. Inflation and deflation have to do with expansion and contraction. So they, they have to do with money supply. But there's no reason for prices to go up. Now, what the politicians try to claim is that, well, we need prices to go up because the prices fall. They say businesses can't survive. Well, yes, they can. If their costs are also falling, what, what counts is margins. So you can make money in falling prices. In fact, companies make more money when prices are falling because they do more volume. Uh, cell phone companies make more money today selling cell phones than they did 30 years ago. The price is much lower than they were 30 years ago because now they sell them to everybody. Back 30 years ago, only the rich could afford a cell phone. Now everybody can afford a cell phone because the price went down. Or they try to claim, well, you know, consumers won't buy anything. If they, if they think prices are going down, they're just going to indefinitely sit back and wait and no one's going to spend. Which, again, if that was true, nobody would have a cell phone. Nobody would have a television. Nobody would have a computer. I mean, it's nonsense. People don't hold off on their consumption because they're waiting for a lower price. There's a value to today. Yes, I can wait. I can wait a year and get a lower price, but that means I have to go a year without the thing that I want. There is a time uh, value. I want it now. If I can buy it 2% cheaper in a year, I'm not going to wait. I mean, what if I don't even live a year? I may, I may be dead. Right. So people want to buy. The only reason that people wait for a lower price to buy something is because they can't afford it. It's like, God, I'd like to buy that, but it's too expensive. You know, I, I, I use the example when I first saw uh, a high definition TV. I went into like a good guys or one of these stores. And this is probably like in the 80s or not a long time ago. And it was like the first high def TV I'd ever seen. And I thought it was amazing. It was like looking through a window. And yeah, I wanted to buy it but it was like $10,000. So I didn't buy it because I couldn't afford it. Right? That's why I didn't buy it. And I thought, well, one day the price will be low enough and I'll be able to buy it. You know, But if the price had just got up from there, you know, well, I, I, mean, I could buy it now because I've made a lot of money, but a lot of people would never have bought those TVs if the price didn't go down. So where this 2% thing came from, right? and this is the evolution of it. So uh, New Zealand went through an economic uh, you know, collapse in the 80s, too much government, too much socialism. And so they did major reforms, including of the central bank. And so the New Zealand Reserve Bank became the first central bank to have an inflation, uh, uh, um, not a target, but a, a, a benchmark of 2%. And the goal was not to have inflation at 2%. It was a ceiling. Mm -hmm. And the way it worked was the Reserve Bank Hat was was charged with making sure inflation stayed below two percent. It didn't matter how below, if it was one percent, one half percent, or negative. As long as it was below two percent, they were good. But the minute it got to two percent, they needed to do something because they couldn't let it get above two percent. It wasn't a target; it was a ceiling. Mm -hmm. Well, later on, other central banks started talking about two percent, not as a ceiling, but as a target. Meaning that if inflation was 1%, they needed to do something to, to, to push it up to 2%, which was complete nonsense. That was just a, a pretense in order to print money and bail out governments and prop up markets. I used to laugh, you know, I, 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 I see these press conferences with Mario Draghi, because the ECB's target was not even 2%. They kept saying our target is to be close to, but below 2%. So they didn't even want to be two. They wanted to be like 1.99, right? Two is too much. And so the, it, there were years where Eurozone inflation was like one and a half, like 1.6, 1.7. And so Draghi would say, yeah, we're still below 2%. So we're going to have to have negative interest rates. We're going to keep doing quantitative easing so we could push inflation from 1.7 to 1.99. <laughs> and it was like, what, what are you, serious? You're just flooding the economy with money. You're creating massive inflation to get to notch the rate up like you could fine tune it. I said years ago, what's going to happen when they blow through 2%, which is what's happened. Now they're closer to 10% than 2%. What are they going to do? I said, now, now we're, I mean, now they're stuck. 
right? I mean, they've still got this massive balance sheet. They haven't done anything to shrink it. And they've raised rates, but they're only at 4%. I mean, that's not nearly enough now. I mean, they should have left well enough alone, right? When inflation was 1.7, they should have said, that's close enough to two. We go, let's, let's raise rates. <laughs> but it was all a pretense so that the Italian government can keep running deficits. Uh, the French government, the Spanish government, Portugal, Greece. I mean, they, they didn't want to force any politicians to cut spending. And that's the same thing that happened in the United States. And they still haven't cut spending. Even though the Fed has raised rates to 5%, even though the Fed is doing quantitative tightening, the deficits are over $2 trillion a year and rising. And, and, and nobody is talking about doing anything to rein them in. I mean, let alone actually doing it. They're not even talking about it. I mean, they used to talk about it and still not do anything. But now they don't even bother talking about it. Well, and I think I've heard you say as well before with the cons uh, Consumer Spending Index that they've actually stripped out things from this index, things like energy and housing and things like this. So when people are looking and trying to see the rising, the rising cost of goods, which I know is an oversupply of money, but when they're seeing prices go up or they're looking at these indexes, Two of the most important things are no longer accounted for. Well, they're accounted for in the headline, but the whole thing is rigged. I mean, according to the official numbers, 2021, 2022, and you know, 2023 is not over yet, but over these three years, the official CPI is going to show about a 20% increase in, in prices, which is huge when you think about it. I mean, that's a big increase in the cost of living in a very short period of time. But I think the reality is it's gone up more than that. Uh, for most of the things that are essential, food, energy, um, uh, and now insurance, uh, and interest rates too. People forget, you know, we had interest rates at zero for a long time. Mortgages were 3%. Now they're closer to 8%. Yeah, wow. That is a big increase in the cost of money. Um, and people are paying that, but that's part of your cost of living. You can't ignore that. The Fed is like, oh, we're, we're fighting inflation by raising rates. But what about the rates? They're a lot higher. That's a price. That's the price of money. Everything is affected by that. Um, if you are a business and you have various costs, you have you know labor costs, you have raw material costs, you have rents, but you also have interest. Maybe you've borrowed money to buy uh, a, a capital equipment that your your workers are using, and you had a adjustable rate financing on that on that debt. That cost has skyrocketed. That's part of your cost curve. You've got to pass that on to the end customer, just like you have to pass on, you know, your raw material costs, your labor costs. So the Fed just acts like these interest rates have no effect. They have a huge effect. That doesn't mean they shouldn't be raising rates. They just have to acknowledge the big effect, because when they kept interest rates really low, that's one of the reasons that the inflation numbers officially were low, because businesses passed on these low rates. They, they, they could afford to charge lower prices because their interest costs were so much lower. Uh, but but that's all changed. So none of this is going to fight inflation. That's the, the market just doesn't get it. Yep. The days of low inflation are gone. Inflation is going to be very high for as far as the eye can see. And that's what the gold markets haven't priced in. That's what the bond markets still haven't priced in the dollar. They still think we can go back to where we were. We can't. That was an aberration. That only existed for a brief window in time. And because we had that, now we're going to have the payback. Now we're going to have the flip side, which is going to be high interest rates, high inflation, stagflation. Uh, you know, we basically made a deal with the devil to delay the day of reckoning. And, you know, the devil's uh, here to collect. So does the Fed have any moves left? Are we or are we really done kicking the can down the road? No, I think at this point, you know, we've we've reached a fork in that road. And no matter which direction they kick it, 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 it's a disaster. Because so the Fed can do one of two things. The Fed can keep on fighting inflation and keep on hiking rates and allow a financial crisis that's worse than 2008 and with no bailouts. Let the banks fail. I mean, the banks are in worse shape now than they were in 2008. Nobody understands this. And I just talked about this in my own podcast. But the problem in 2008, 2007 was foreclosures. People weren't paying their mortgages because the, the, the value of their house went down. And so they just weren't paying. Um, or they had a, an adjustable rate mortgage and they could no longer afford it because the rate went up. right? And there was no incentive to make the payments because they were underwater. So it was 
losses on bad mortgages that were the problems for the banks. But it was only a small fraction of the mortgages that went bad. Most of them were okay. Today, it's got nothing to do with defaults. Right? In fact, defaults would actually help the banks. They're, they're, they're praying for some defaults. The problem is people are paying their mortgages, and the mortgages have collapsed in value because they wrote these 3% mortgages, and now the mortgage rates are almost 8 They are underwater. They have lost a fortune. These mortgages are worth maybe 60 cents on the dollar. They're, they're, they're basically insolvent. And now there, there's a run on these banks because their customers want their money back because they want to get interest, because they can get 5% in a money market and the banks are paying nothing. Mm -hmm. So they go to the bank and they say, I want my money. Well, the bank doesn't have the money because it loaned it out on a mortgage. And if it sells the mortgage, it's going to get 60 cents, not a dollar. So what are they doing? Well, the only reason they're not all bankrupt right now is because the Federal Reserve says, OK, you bring me that mortgage that's worth 60 cents and I'll give you the dollar so that you can repay your customers and, and, and not be insolvent. So they're doing that. But those are loans. Next year, the banks have to pay the, the Fed back the dollar, but they don't have the dollar. The customers took it and put it in a money market and loaned it to the U.S. government. So all these banks are going to fail unless the Fed permanently props them up with massive quantitative easing. The banks are in much worse shape now because all the, all the mortgages are bad. Not just some, they're all bad. <laughs> you know, the best thing that can happen to a bank right now is somebody defaults because now they can tear up that 3% mortgage. That, that's where the losses are. But no one wants to default because their biggest asset is their mortgage. They got this great mortgage. They're going to keep that forever and take it to the grave. You know, so this is a bigger crisis. Also, in 2008, commercial real estate was OK, because even though there was a great recession, interest rates plunged and that pushed up the value of commercial real estate because it's like a bond. So there really were no losses on commercial real estate. Today, it, it's a basket case. Commercial real estate prices are down 50 percent, 60 percent, 70 percent. Their income has collapsed because they have massive vacancies. But now interest rates have gone up to 23-year highs. Um, the, the banks are in a lot of trouble because all these commercial real estate loans are going to go into default, and there's no collateral. So you have the residential crisis of default in commercial real estate, which was we didn't have in 08. And now in the residential real estate is all the mortgages are on the road. So the banks are in worse shape. And I, I predicted this when we bailed out the banks that were too big to fail. I said, if we bail these banks out, Eventually, they're going to be even bigger and they're still going to fail. And if they were too big to fail in 2008, what about now? Were well, they way bigger than they were if we would have let them fail? So we're sitting on a, a monster of a problem. So the Fed can either keep fighting inflation and let the banks fail. And of course, it's not just going to be the bondholders, the stockholders will lose money. The depositors are going to lose money because if 100%. the Fed is fighting inflation, the FDIC has no money. Uh, the government's going to have to cut Social Security benefits, Medicare benefits, not just to people in the future, but the people right now who are getting checks. The government's going to say your next check is going to be smaller. That's what they have to do if, if the Fed keeps fighting inflation. Um, and we may even have to restructure the debt. The government may actually have to say, you know, you bought a Treasury bond uh, you know, for $1,000. Uh, we, we, we can't afford to pay you $1,000. We're just going to give you $500. 50 cents on a dollar. I mean, you know, what are, they're going to have to do something or they're going to have to say, you know, you bought a Treasury bill. It was supposed to mature next week. We're going to extend that maturity out for 30 years. We'll keep paying you the 1% the interest that you signed up for, but we're going to do it for the next 30 years. We're not giving you your money back. I mean, they're going to have to do something. Yeah. Right. So it's a massive crisis if the Fed fights inflation. But what if the Fed is like, oh, we can't allow that. Right. Well, we, we can't force the we can't have a bank failures and defaults on Social Security. So we're going to stop fighting inflation. We're going to print more money. We're going to monetize more government debt. We're going to prop up the banks. We're going to enable these deficits. So we're going to make it so the government doesn't have to cut Social Security. We're going to make it so the government could repay its debts in full. Well, that means we have runaway inflation, maybe hyperinflation. right? So you lose your money either way. Either you know the government doesn't give you back your money, or you get money that doesn't buy anything. You don't get your, you lose your purchasing power. There, there's, there's no way people are going to get paid. The Social Security benefits are not going to get paid, right? Because either they're going to be cut or they're going to be worthless. 
right? So th th those are the choices, but we're right at that point because when the Fed went to QE in the past, whether it was 2008 or you know 2020 with COVID, they always had the excuse that, well, we're below our 2% inflation target. So this gives us the leeway to, to, to print all this money and cut rates because, you know, we're still below 2%. But how is the market going to react when inflation is 4 5 6% and headed higher and the Fed slashes rates? The Fed, you know, goes back to QE. I mean, they can't say that, you know, inflation is below 2% anymore. Now, what are they going to do? Are they going to say, well, our new inflation target is 6? I mean, are they going to change the target? But, but the markets are, are going to react violently to this revelation of how much purchasing power the dollar is going to lose in the future, in which case it can't be the reserve currency anymore. I mean, that's impossible. Uh, and, and so the dollar is just going to collapse. And the whole American standard of living is, you know, people don't realize it. It's built on the reserve status of the dollar. Without that, we can't have these trade deficits. Now, without these trade deficits, there's nothing on the shelves at Walmart. You know, there, there's nothing to buy. All, all the stuff is gone because we're getting it for free. And, you know, we have this service sector economy. OK, try to have a service sector economy with no goods. Right. Because most of the services have to do with the goods, distributing the goods, selling the goods, take the goods out of the equation. It's nothing left. Now, it makes a lot of sense. Now, one of my presentations this week is going to be on the commercial real estate sector and what's going on there. And to another point that you had made about the banks, you know, I was on the phone with Rick Rule maybe a month or so ago when we were talking about the bank failures in 2008 versus the bank failures that we've seen in this year. And there's actually been larger and more banks that have been failing in 2023, but the media is not picking it up like that they did before. And I was also watching- yeah, and, and a lot more of them. If it wasn't for what yeah. the Fed was doing, There'd be so many more failures. You're, there's all these bailout. Banks are being bailed out every day secretly because the Fed is, again, taking their bad collateral and giving them cash for it. Uh, and, and, and so, you know, had they not done that, we would have already had a far worse financial crisis. But they can't keep doing this because they did it under the pretense of, well, these are just loans, right? The banks have to pay us back. How? With what money? The money's gone. They can't pay the Fed back. They would all be bankrupt on the same day if the Fed enforced those terms of those loans. You got to pay us back, but we don't have the money. OK, well, you're in default and your bank is, you, you know, your bank is collapsed. You know, ironically, I used to own a bank <laughs> and I and my bank was put out of business by the government. But I was one of the only solvent banks in the country, which is the irony of being put out of business for supposedly being insolvent. I was 100 percent reserve. I didn't make any loans. So I didn't have any problems. I didn't own any mortgages. I don't own any treasuries. I had all my cash in money markets, you know, uh, and I'd, I, you know, I'd be earning, you know, five percent on it right now if my bank was still around, and I could, I could return it. In fact, after they uh, falsely accused my bank of money laundering and tax evasion, they started a run, and seventy percent of seventy-five percent of the deposits were withdrawn, over two hundred million dollars. I just sent it back. I didn't have any problems. I didn't need to go to the government for help. I had the money. Because I didn't tell you 100% reserve. These banks out there have barely reserve, at 2% reserves. There's no real money there. Anytime anybody wants their money, the banks don't have it, especially now because they've loaned it out to 30 years. I was one of the few people, you know, three, four, five years ago that was critical of these low mortgages because people kept saying, this is great. All these Americans have this opportunity to lower their mortgage payment. And I said, yeah, it's great for the borrower, but it's horrible for the lenders. The lenders yeah. are getting trapped in these low yielding mortgages. So what's going to happen when interest rates go up? What's going to happen to the banks or anybody who is stuck with this collateral? Nobody cared. Nobody even thought about it. People don't think ahead, just like these currency traders that are buying dollars or selling gold. They, they, they're, not, they're not thinking like they're playing chess. They're not seeing three or four or five moves down the line. They're just looking at a move and they don't have any idea about the consequences. I know how this game ends. I know where the checkmate is. <laughs> so <laughs> again, that's why I said, you know, I, if you're not going to get out of the country physically, at least get your money out while you can. I mean, that is the big thing. That's what I'm doing with my clients at Europe Pacific Asset Management is we're investing all around the world to get out of U.S. dollar assets. And there's still a lot of cheap stocks around the world that you can get good dividends on and types of businesses that do well during stagflation, inflation, uh, basic companies, energy, raw material companies, 
food and beverage companies, utilities, uh, companies that sell their customers things that the customers have to buy. And they will, they will give up other things to keep buying those things. And they pay good dividends. And you, you know, so you need to own real things in an inflation or time period. You can't just be clipping coupons on, on, on a bond. Um, and we, you know, we do have a lot of uh, uh, gold and silver. You know, my clients are going to shift gold and we're, they're buying gold and silver. But we have a lot of strategies in Europe Pacific Asset Management uh, where we invest in mining companies, you know, you know, precious metals mining companies. I have a gold fund, uh, separately managed accounts. Uh, people should be taking advantage. I bought more for my own account last week. Uh, I had dry powder because I saw, you know, some weakness. And I don't just buy gold stocks. I, I have other stocks, too. But the gold stocks were the ones I focused in on this week because they really got beat up. You had the GDX was down 8% on the week. The GDXJ was down 10%. Uh, and uh, I like to buy stuff when it goes down, especially when it's already cheap and mm -hmm. then it gets cheaper. So uh, people should be taking advantage of other people's ignorance. You know, I, I, I made uh, a decent amount of money back in 2007. Uh, by shorting subprime because uh, you know people didn't understand uh, what those mortgages were worth. I knew I knew that defaults were coming uh, to, because again I was playing chess. I understood the ultimate consequences of what the Fed had done uh, and what it meant for the banks that were holding all these mortgages that I knew were going to go bad because I knew about the defaults. Well, now it's not again. It's not the defaults. The mortgages are bad because of rates. They were dumb enough to make all these uh, low interest rate mortgages. You know, I mean, if I, I wouldn't have done those mortgages, I, I wouldn't give somebody a 3% mortgage. There's some people that have them in the twos. During COVID, banks were approving people with mortgage rates in the twos. Insane. I mean, how asinine is that? You're going to loan somebody money for 30 years and they're going to pay you two and three quarters? I mean, what did they think? COVID was going to be around for the next 30 years and, that, and rates would stay at zero the whole time? I mean, the banks do a lot of stupid things. And the main reason is because the government guarantees them all, right? Yeah. They have all this deposit insurance. I mean, the, the, the banks are fraught with risk because there's no real capitalism in banking. You know, that's what we need. We need to get, get the government out of banking. In fact, we have to get the government out of everything, but particularly banking. Uh, and so we have honest, sound banks. Instead, the whole system is, is, is insolvent and it depends on inflation to prop it up. Now, I've been listening to your work for a very long time, Peter, and I've never heard you comment on this. So this is a question just from my side, because I'm super curious. A couple of months ago, I was, I think I was flying somewhere and I rewatched The Big Short after many years. How come they don't give you a shout out in that movie? I figure they've got to give you some type of a shout out in there because you watched all these things. You talked about them, did you not? No, I mean, I look, instead of, I know there's a scene there, you know, where... You know, the, the guys, you know, the, the main character goes to a conference and there's somebody up on the stage talking. That, I, I was the guy on the stage. <laughs> it's like I went, it, you could look at my mortgage banker speech in 2006. I went to Las Vegas uh, and that was the second year I spoke. I spoke in 05 and 06. And uh, in 05, I was warning about this too. And then they ended up bringing me back to have this debate. So the only reason I went was because I was looking for investors to short subprime. I had just helped set up this fund with this guy, Andy Lottie, and the two of us, you know, had set up this fund and we were looking for investors to, to short subprime. So I, I told these guys, look, I'll come and, and, and do your speech and do this debate, but I want you to give me a workshop because I'm trying to find investors for, for this hedge fund. And so they said, okay. And so I, I did the talk and, and you could he hear me during my talk, I'm teasing about the subprime short and that we're putting money together to short the subprime mortgage market. This is before the whole thing blew up. It blew up in 07. And I'm, sure. I'm, 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 I'm talking about why it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow up. So I had my, um, my, um, my workshop, probably had, there was 3,000 mortgage bankers that were in Vegas. I probably had maybe 50, 80 of them came to my workshop. So most of them didn't even care about learning about how to short subprime. But of the ones that came, one person invested, one person. Uh, I think I, I, I think he sent in 500k and I, I sent him back five million like a year later. So he made like 10 times his money. But um, so this one guy, the only guy that invested. But but also, I, I never really got a lot of credit for the predictions. I mean, initially, yeah, there were some people in the media that that mentioned me. I know I got I got I did get mentioned in in, in, in Harvey Sarkin's book. You know, because uh, about a quote I had about Lehman Brothers, where I said, look, I don't believe these earnings. You know, I, I, I think they're in a lot of trouble. 
you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I knew these banks were going to fail. And so there was a lot of, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, and, and initially the public, you know, there was a couple million views on that Peter Schiff was right video back in, in, in 2008. So the public kind of knew, yeah, Schiff has been warning about it. But the media, the reason the media, I think, was very reluctant to give me, I think, the credit that I deserve. They're not that, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't have a big enough bed. I didn't have enough money at the time to have become a billionaire. You know, I mean, I made, made you know a few million dollars, but it was like you know, it wasn't like what you know what these up like the uh, the big guys made, right? Um, maybe if I'd made a billion, it, they they would have paid attention to me. But I I didn't make enough money. I didn't have enough people in my fund. You know, I was a retail shop. You know, sure. I, the government made it hard for me to get people because I had to have a hundred thousand dollar minimum, and I, I, a lot of my clients didn't have a hundred thousand to gamble on subprime. Because I was dealing with, you know, retail investors, uh, not you know big institutions like these other guys were. Um, but I think the big thing was I blamed everything on government. I blamed it all on the Fed. <laughs> sure. And that's that's what caused it. I mean, that's how I knew it was going to happen, you know, as, as accurately as I did. And the media didn't want to elevate that position because they wanted to pretend it was greedy capitalism. And, yeah, and, and of course. That did it. And, and, you know, I remember that the, the government had a hearing after the 2008 financial crisis. They held congressional hearings to figure out why we had the crisis. And I was like, oh, I'll tell you why, because, you know, I, I predicted it. I wrote a book predicting it. I was warning about it for years. I could tell you exactly why we had that crisis. And they didn't invite me. They wouldn't let me speak. Wow. Instead, they had all these witnesses that were as clueless about the crisis as everybody explaining why we had it. And, of course, they all got it wrong. They all blamed it on not enough regulation. Well, they knew that. They were using that as a pretense to now have more regulation. I would have said the problem was too much regulation, and here's the ones you need to repeal. Here's mm -hmm. the government regulation that did it, and here's the Fed policy that did it. Here's what we need to change. We And no, the Fed got more power. The government got more power. So they wanted to diminish me because they, they didn't want that message going out. Right? That was contrary uh, to their narrative, you know, even, you know, when 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 they appointed Janet Yellen, right, to be a uh, uh, Fed chair, Barack Obama introduced her as here's the person that was warning about the financial crisis. If only people had listened to her. And I really? remember that. I, I listened <laughs> to that. And I was like, what are you talking about? I don't remember her warning about anything. So I, I read these articles and everybody was giving her credit for having warned about the housing market and, and the financial crisis. So there were two particular speeches that everybody was saying, here's where she warned about it. So I went back and, 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 and you know, read or watched those, those speeches. And not only did she not warn about it, she actually said that the people who were warning about it were wrong, <laughs> that there was nothing to worry about, that everything was great, that there was no problem in the housing market, and that even if housing prices went down, it wouldn't even hurt the economy. I mean, she was so wrong and so clueless. The media just completely reinvented her and turned her into some kind of Chrysandra <laughs> when she was just as, as clueless as everybody else. So I, I made a YouTube video of that at the time. And I said, look, here's what she actually said. This is what the New York Times claimed she said. Here's what she said. <laughs> so, so, so none of those people... I had any idea that the crisis was coming. And it's the same people who don't see this crisis. The crisis that we are on the cusp of now is way bigger than financial crisis. I mean, it's not even close uh, in, in, in magnitude. And again, you know, after COVID, how many people, when they did COVID, when they had the lockdowns and everybody was saying, oh, this is deflationary, like all this, you know, I, I was the one guy that was out there saying, what are you kidding? This is the most inflationary uh, policy I've ever seen in my life. You know, at the, on the one hand, we're telling people not to work. In fact, we're preventing them from working. So they're not producing. And we're mailing them checks and telling them to go out and buy stuff. Yeah. Buy what? They're not making anything. And in fact, a lot of people got more stimulus money than they used to earn when they were working. So it was the most toxic combination of monetary and fiscal policy, we're still on the cusp of it. We, we ain't seen nothing. Prices yeah. have got so much further to rise. Uh, but I was one of the few people that was warning about it. And I, I, I talked about the bond market back then. I said, this is it. You know, I said, this is the top of the bond market, you know, back in 2000 when treasury yields were sub 1%. So this is it. This is the end of the long term. This is the climactic blow off 
we're now in the going to be in the mother of all bear markets. And I've been you know bearish, bearish on bonds all the way up. The yields now got this week the, the 30 year got to 4.8, uh, 23 year high. But this is just the beginning. This is going to be worse than the 70s, 80s bear market. We're going to be double digit yields. Now, the Fed could try the yield curve control. The Fed could try what Japan is doing. The Fed could go back to massive QE, and they will, but it's ultimately going to blow up. But because, you know, with inflation, when they have to try to, you know, go back to QE to, to, to prevent all this, inflation is going to be so high that bond yields on anything the Fed isn't going to buy, corporates, munis, it's going to be prohibitively expensive for anybody. Sure. So now the Fed is going to have to monetize everything, which means the money is worthless. So, I mean, I, I, now maybe before we get to that point, these guys do the right thing. But the longer we wait to do the right thing, the harder it is to do it and the more money people are going to lose. Doing the right thing and government sounds like an oxymoron to me. So I'm just not sure about that ever materializing in my life. Yeah, well, that that's because from a political from a the vantage point of a politician, doing the right thing is whatever makes it more likely that he or she gets reelected. Yeah, of course. So the incentives are are skewed in the wrong direction for sure. Yeah, they, 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 what ha what's good for the country is 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 you know immaterial. It's secondary. Yeah. It's what's good for their careers. Now, if they can help their career and also help the country, OK, great. Sure. That's just a bonus. <laughs> but if they have to sacrifice the country to help their career, well, that's what they're willing to do. Right. I mean, they don't care that the well-being of the nation is secondary to their job perpetuation. That's that's their main goal. So that's why it's such a problem, because they're always thinking in terms of what policy gets me reelected, not what policy helps the country. Because generally, the policies that help the country are not popular, right? Because they, in the short run, somebody's got to lose something, right? It's just like, you know, when you're working out, right? It's no pain, no gain. That's, that's the saying, right? right? Well, if there's any pain, you don't get reelected. The voters don't like pain. <laughs> so it's like, what? You're out of here, right? So nobody wants to, you know, be the messenger, Right. Because they shoot the messenger. Right. They vote for they, they vote for the messenger's opponent. So nothing good gets done. That is the fatal flaw in democracy. The founding fathers understood this. They were smart, unlike our current leaders. <laughs> and uh, so they established the American Republic and they hoped that we would never become a democracy. Unfortunately, their fears have been realized and we're living with the consequences. Let's talk a little bit about CBDCs. I was in Tbilisi, Georgia last month, and I got a chance to meet the chairman of the Federal Reserve over in Georgia. And we asked him some questions. I, I watched him speak. And he was very bullish on CBDCs and was seemed completely oblivious to the fact that the entire audience thought they were just disgusting. What do you think is going to happen with CBDCs going forwards? Well, uh, I think that there's a lot to be nervous about with respect to uh, CBC, CBS, yeah, central bank digital currencies. Because um, uh, obviously, if the government wants to enable them, it's because they see it as another means of control, uh, of surveillance, of uh, you know oppression. Uh, to the extent that the central bank digital currencies would exist alongside of the physical currency and, and consumers would have a choice over what to use, then I, I, I don't think there'd be uh, as big a problem. But what I would be worried about is it's the camel's nose under the tent. First, they introduce the central bank digital currency and then they eliminate all the physical currency. And therefore, you have no ability to engage in commerce that the government doesn't know about. And now the government knows everything you do, everything you buy, every, everybody you do business with. And now you might think, well, if you're a law abiding citizen, you know, why should you care? Right. Only the criminals. Right. Oh, only the criminals have to care if the government knows everything they do. Well, what if what you're doing isn't criminal, but then it becomes criminal later on because the government is the criminal. Right. I mean, the government uh, can be very oppressive. You know, they, they can have laws. Um, and. They're they're not fair laws. I mean, like it, let's say you know you know during slavery, right? People will agree now slavery was bad. Well, if you helped a slave escape, you know, in 1850, you were committing a crime. Well, was was it wrong to help a slave escape? Well, well, so 
it, it, but the government would have to figure out that you were doing it. Well, obviously, if they had all this surveillance, they could immediately know who's helping the slaves, and they could go, they could go get them. So, you know, if the government becomes very oppressive at some point, even more than it is now, and we as citizens want to try to organize, to try to resist this oppression, it's going to be a lot harder if we can't spend any money without the government knowing exactly what we just bought or where we just gathered. Or, you know, you don't want to empower your government to have, you know, uh, uh, that much surveillance, to be able to spy on everybody and know exactly what everybody's doing. And even if the government is not bad now, once you give them that tool, it's more likely that they'll become bad. Right? Sure. You're enabling them. You always have to be vigilant, right? There's an old quote, you know, where the government, where the people, where the government fears the people, you have freedom. Where the people fear the government, you have tyranny, right? I want the government fearing the people. I don't want them to think that they can, they know everything that we're doing. Uh, and, and the other problem with these central bank digital currencies is it makes it even easier for the Federal Reserve or any central bank to try to manipulate the economy because you can jump the money supply very quickly, just like you know, crank you know instantly, or you could basically create digital currency that has an expiration date. This money is good for 30 days. Spend it or you lose it. You yep. know? Or it's only good at these stores. Oh, you can't use it for certain merchandise or you can't, you know, it's like, so it, it's, it, it tends to corruption because what if I, what if, you know, some businessman gets in bed with the government and says, look, why don't you, why don't you say it's only good here? You know, this is give people money to use at my stores. But it just, just it, if we've had inflation, with paper money, we're going to have even more inflation uh, with the digital variety. Look, what, what I want is to get government out of money. Uh, if government needs money, they need to earn it like everybody else. Now, the way governments earn money is by taxing, right? So that's what they have to do. I want to go back to the good old days where if the government wants your money, they have to honestly take it from you through a legitimate tax. Uh, and, and so the government can't be in a position to create money out of thin air. And money has to have real value. Money has to be, you know, a store value. Uh, uh, and so we should be on a gold standard. And to the extent that we have digital currency, it should all be backed by gold, which is fine, because that would be better than paper currency backed by gold, which is what we used to have, and that worked good. Uh, a digital currency backed by gold will work even better, because it's, it's, it's easier to conduct business in a digital currency. See, the problem with something like, you know, Bitcoin is it's difficult to conduct commerce with it because it's very expensive to uh, uh, transfer it, but the price is quite volatile. So you can't really price goods in, in Bitcoin. You don't really know what a Bitcoin is going to be worth. Um, and there's no real store of value there. I mean, you have no idea what, if any value, Bitcoin is going to have in the future. There are some people that think it's going to be worth millions of Bitcoin, and there's some people like me that think it's going to be worth nothing. Mm -hmm. But regardless... Nobody knows for sure what it's going to be worth. So it can't be a store of value. And it's not a good medium of exchange or a unit of account for all these reasons. But gold works great as all three. It's a great uh, uh, unit of account. You can price stuff in grams of gold. It's an easy medium of exchange, especially when it's digital. And it's a store of value. It's not a store of value you know, every day, but it, over a long time, it, it stores its value. And if gold was used as money, I think it would even be less volatile than it is now, and it's not even that volatile. It's less sure. volatile than most assets, except for this last week. I mean, it was down 4%. That's big for gold. Bitcoin can go up down 4%, you know, in an hour, in, a, in 10 minutes. I mean, uh, you know, up, it can go down 4%, then up 4%. So, uh, but yeah, that's what we need. We need, we need uh, a currency backed by gold. I'd rather the private sector issue it. I mean, if the government issued it, it would be much better than what we have now. And it would be much better than a digital currency backed by a fiat currency like like the dollar, the euro, the yen. Mm -hmm. But it's always better to have the private sector do it. I mean, anything that the private sector can do, it should do, uh, which so, is almost everything. You know, the government should only do things that the private sector can't. And there's very few things that the private sector can't do better than the government. Agreed with that 100 percent. Have you been following along with the BRICS and a possible BRIC currency backed by gold? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that would make a lot of sense uh, for those nations to move in that direction. Look, all the nations have to move away from the dollar. I mean, we made that clear as if they didn't know that already. But the sanctions on Russia were a real, uh, you know, alarm bell for everybody that they need to de-dollarize, that they need to get their head out from that noose. Right. Because as long as everybody is in the dollar system, uh, the U.S. basically calls the shots. 
because if you don't do what America says, well, we're going to pull, pull the rope on that noose, right? And, and we're going to cut you out of the global system. We're going to freeze your reserves. Um, and so why put yourself in that position? And so I think that the world is trying to get out of it. And that's what you're seeing. And, you know, the countries that are moving away from the dollar are the ones that we need the most because they're the, the, the countries where we buy the most stuff and we buy it with our dollars and they only take our dollars because they're part of this system. But once they're out of the system and no longer dealing in dollars, they don't need them anymore. And so how are we going to get their stuff? Well, we're not. Not sure. unless we give them stuff that they want. Right now, you know, the Chinese make us products and we get those and we print money and they get that. Well, <laughs> what, what good is the money? You know, it's just paper. You know, there's a lot of value in the stuff that we get from them. There's no value in what they get from us. It took them lots of resources to make all these consumer goods, land, labor, capital. It took us nothing to digitally uh, create out of thin air dollars. Uh, so when that arrangement goes away, yes, you know, Americans will still want to buy Chinese goods, but they're going to have to pay for them with American goods, not, not paper, real stuff. Yep. And if we don't give them our stuff, well, I guess we can give them our, our assets. We can give them our stocks. We can give them our real estate, but they're not going to take our paper. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Peter, last question. Any predictions, any final predictions for 2024? What we're going to see, what's coming our way? Um, well, I mean, we got a category five economic hurricane. <laughs> the only question is, will it hit before 2024, during 2024 or after? I mean, again, I've been I've been bad at uh, knowing when the crisis was going to come. I mean, even the 2008 crisis, I started predicting it, you know, back in 2002, 2003. If you go back and read what I was warning, because I, I saw the problem the Fed was creating the minute rates went to one. I immediately knew. I just didn't know that, you know, it would last until 08 before it hit the fan. And the mistakes that they've made this time dwarf those. And and so it, and it's taken even longer for the consequences to manifest. In fact, they still haven't fully blown up yet. Uh, so it's hard to say. I, I just wouldn't want to chance it. You know, I mean, I'm just, you know, prepared. I'm ready. I know this is coming to me, it, you know, whether it comes in 20, 2024, 2025, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's going to happen. I do know that the longer it takes, the worse it's going to be. So if it happens in 2025, it's going to be worse than what would have happened in 20. 24. But people need to be prepared, uh, you know, for uh, either a complete collapse of the uh, economy and the financial system or runaway inflation, which, of course, will lead to a, a collapse of the economy as well. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the reasons that I think that that's the poison that they're going to pick is because the inflationary consequences will be delayed a bit versus just letting everything fall apart. But also, it's easier for the government to blame the inflation on somebody else. You know, yeah. I mean, they're good at that. They've been doing that for a long time. You know, it's greedy consumers. It's greedy businessmen. It's Putin. It's it's uh, uh, OPEC. I mean, they'll even try to blame it on me. I mean, maybe not by name, but, you know, you gold speculators, you know, you've been buying gold and, you know, selling dollars, you know. So who knows? Right. They're going to they're going to villainize people and, uh, and and try to scapegoat. They're never going to accept responsibility for creating the inflation. Uh, but if they if they just let banks fail and they don't bail them out, well, then everyone's going to blame them. Well, why didn't you bail us out? You know, where was the government asleep? You know, why didn't you do this? So they, they don't want to do nothing. They, they, they want to do something, even if all they can do is create inflation, because that's really all the politicians do. They don't have any other magic tools. They can't produce consumer goods. Right. They don't create any wealth. They can just redistribute it. And if they don't redistribute it through taxation, they redistribute it through inflation. And that's really all they have. I mean, that's all they've ever had. They, they just paper everything over by creating inflation. And people think they've solved the problem. They haven't. They've just made the problems worse. 100%. Peter, amazing. And yes, this is exactly what we're talking about this entire week at the Expat Money Summit. We got 40 presentations this week trying to present real life solutions. Peter Schiff, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Amazing conversation. All right, great. Have a successful conference.